Well, good morning, and welcome to our worship service at the Bath Church of the New Jerusalem in Bath, Maine. I'm the pastor here, Reuben Bell. Glad to be the pastor here. I had Jesse play that hymn this morning because, A, I like it. I've, I've been accused of using it too often, but it just seemed to go with what I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to read you the first uh, verse. If you but ask the Lord to guide you and hope in him through all your days, he'll give you strength whate'er betide you and bear you up in all your ways. Who trusts the Lord in faith and love builds on the rock that none can move. So I love that song. I hope you do too because there's a message there. And I think you got it. Now this morning, I'm going to talk about sin Whoa, no, he's going to talk about sin. When I was a little boy and the preacher started talking about sin, it was time to get under the pew, let me tell you, because they used to talk about it in a big way. Then they would talk about where you go when you did all those sins. But that was when I was a little boy. Now, I've learned a lot of things since then, and I've learned that sin is an interesting concept. The church, over centuries, has done a lot of damage with the, with the concept of sin, they built it into something perhaps that it wasn't meant to be. We're going to learn, I'm going to talk about it today, that the whole concept of sin in Judaism and then in, in Christianity originally had to do with missing the mark. Okay, you're going to aim at something. Oops, I missed. So what do you do? Go home? No. You try it again. And I think the idea is you keep shooting till you hit the mark. That's what the Lord had intended with this idea of sin. Uh, remember he told the lady who had kind of messed up her life, go and sin no more. You know, he didn't set her on fire. He said, go and sin no more. That's what he meant. So we're going to talk about sin. But I'm going to talk about a certain aspect of sin. And that has to do with what about the sins that we've all committed. I know I have. How about you, of course. What happened to those sins? Because this is a problem for a lot of people. They carry those around in a big bag on their back all of their life. Now also, as a little boy, I was told, well, when you do certain things, those sins are gone. And as a little boy, I said, well, no, they're not. And so how do you, and as an adult, you say, no, they're not. So you carry them around in a bag on your back. That's called a burden. We're not supposed to do that. So today we're going to talk about what about those sins you've done, those things you may have done that you shouldn't have done and you know it, but you did. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Sin, what happens to sin, how do, how, what's the disposition of those things that we might have done? It's really important because the Lord never intended for us to carry a heavy burden of past events. No, he wants us to live abundantly, he said. So sorry, I got into the sermon, but I'll, uh, I'll do more. Uh, rise, please, for the opening of the word. The Lord said, Surely they are my people. Therefore he became their Savior. In all their distress... He too was distressed. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of eternity. A recitation this morning is in the uh, Red Liturgy. It's number 34, and it's on page 160, and we'll say this together. And I sent this to you folks at home, wherever you might be, so you have this if you want to read it along with us. It's part of Psalm 119, which is a very long psalm, but this is just part. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant. 
who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your justice. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you know the springs of our life. All the thought of our heart is laid open before you. From you no secret is hidden. Enlighten our minds, we pray, that we may see and acknowledge our secret sins and open transgressions and be made pure in heart by your might and by your power. O oh Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray now the prayer that the Lord himself has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we pray together a prayer for our own Bath Church, saying, Heavenly Father, make this church of ours, we pray, a place where men and women of all conditions may come face to face with you and know firsthand your love, your truth, and your power. Bless this church, O Lord, in all its activities. Renew its vitality. Strengthen its faith and reliance on you alone. Fill our lives with the single motive of serving you and our neighbors, making the Bath New Church a center of spiritual inspiration for the community all around. Make us a portal for the New Jerusalem that is even now coming into the world. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord and the teachings of our church, first as it's written in Ezekiel. Now in this part of Ezekiel, Ezekiel has been carried up in the visions of God, it says, where a mysterious, mystical man of bronze shows him a city in which there was a marvelous temple. And from out of this temple, water was flowing deeper and wider on its way to the sea. You settle back and Listen to this. this. This is so wonderful. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, from the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. Then when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. Then he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region goes down into the valley and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, the waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there, for they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. Now, we jump all the way to the end at the book of Revelation, and we find again a marvelous vision of a river. Ezekiel's marvelous river. This time it's flowing from the throne of God, this time out of the new Jerusalem. And this is John talking here in this vision of the future. He showed me a pure river of the water of life, bright as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the midst of her street and of the river, on this side and that was the tree of life bearing 12 fruits according to each and every month. 
and the leaves of the tree were for medicine for the healing of the nations. And no accursed thing shall be there. And the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in her, and his servants shall serve him. Two really wonderful images of a river. We're going to talk about rivers today. I like rivers. Three passages now from the teachings for the new church. And as, as I read these, think in your mind, remember me, I'm the process guy. Think process and how things don't occur in one, uh, in one instance, but always in a process. Okay, first, Arcana Celestia, which is Secrets of Heaven, number 9937. Every person's deeds remain with them after death. And according to the quality of these, they are then judged either to life or to death. Their quality is from their love and their faith. For love and faith make the life of a deed. Therefore, they cannot be taken away by transfer to another who would carry them. Hmm. Next, number 8393. Sins are continually being forgiven a person by the Lord, for he is mercy itself. But sins adhere to them, however much they may suppose that they may have been forgiven. Nor are they removed from him except through a life according to the commands of faith. So far as they live according to these commands, so far their sins are removed. And so far as they are removed, so far they have been forgiven. There's that process. It's kind of dose-related in this case, isn't it? And lastly, from the same book, number nine. Uh, 9014. The majority within the church think that the forgiveness of sins involves wiping and washing them away, like the removal of dirt by water, and that after forgiveness, people go about clean and pure. This idea reigns especially with those who attribute all of salvation to faith alone. But let it be known that the situation with the forgiveness of sins is altogether different from that being mercy itself to everyone that sins. Nevertheless, they do not come to be forgiven unless the person sincerely repents, refrains from evils, and after that leads a life of faith and charity, doing so to the end of their life. When this happens, the person receives spiritual life from the Lord, called new life. Then, when with this new life, he looks at the evils of his former life, turns away from them, and abhors them, his evils have for the first time been forgiven. For the person is now maintained in truths and forms of good by the Lord and held back from evils. This shows what the forgiveness of sins is, and that it cannot take place within an hour, nor within a year. Amen. Here in the lessons, blessed are those who hear the word of the Lord, the teachings of our church, and keep them.
We begin our prayers by praying for the sick, saying we pray for the sick, grant them health, raise them up from their sickness, and let them have perfect health of body and soul. For you are the Savior and benefactor. You are Lord and King of all. Lord, we come to you again as we always do, as a group of friends, but a group of believers as well, a group of members and associates of this small church. And there are those among us and those we are aware of who are in need of your special attention at this time. We ask that you go to them, Lord. We raise them up. There's a young man named Thomas, Lord, who is apparently in great distress. We ask you to go to this man, young man, give him what he needs. We don't know what that is, but you do. We ask you to remember Susan and Jacob. We ask you to remember Carol and Jack and Suzanne, Deb and Jerry, Angela, Keith, and Ken. We ask you to remember Deborah and Charlotte. Remember Lily and Laurie and Ray. Remember Aspen this morning and Catherine. Remember Kathy and the baby Margaret. There are others, Lord, and you know them. We lift them all up to you, Lord, for you to bring them exactly what each one needs because we don't know what that is. We also ask you, Lord, to remember the people who are caring for some of these people, these people who have spent time and effort, decision-making. They need wisdom. Give that to them, Lord, as well as comfort on a daily basis. For this we give you thanks. And now, Lord, each one of us comes to you in the quiet of our heart to speak with you of things that only we might know. Amen. I pray now a prayer of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov from long ago. God of wholeness, God of healing, envelop all the world with wholeness and well-being. Heal us, we pray, in body and soul. Let all the elements of our bodies work together in perfect symmetry and harmony. Remove every trace of illness, every hint of infirmity, any threat of contagion, send us the healing which you alone can bring. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. So our lessons today are about two things, sin and rivers, but not just any rivers. Ezekiel saw a mighty river flowing out from its source in the temple of God. John saw a pure river of the water of life, bright as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. Now this river, it's the same in both versions, watered the tree of life and was for the healing of the nations, it says. Let's look at Two things today, sin, those things we may have done that we wish we hadn't, but we did, and rivers, the ones flowing from the throne of God to, to what? To wash away our sins? When I thought that our lesson today from Secrets of Heaven told us that that doesn't really happen that way. Hmm. So what does happen to those sins of ours that we would like to be rid of, that we would like to forget about? Well, they're removed, it says. Displaced, transported, carried along by the Lord as he flows in. Remember the river, as he flows in to make us new. 
Let's keep this river image in mind. The mighty power of flowing water as we explore the idea of removals. Another one of those words we run across in the new church that carry lots of meaning. As we explore the idea of removals, one of the mechanisms of our salvation. The question here is, what happens to our sins when they are forgiven? Okay, Because they are forgiven. We read that today in no uncertain terms. Sins are continually being forgiven a person by the Lord for he is mercy itself. We read that. I believe that. Now, the teaching of the traditional Christian church is clear on this. What happens to our sins? Well, they're gone. Washed clean. For as we also read, the majority within the Christian church think that the forgiveness of sins involves wiping and washing them away, like the removal of dirt by water, that after forgiveness, people go about clean and pure. This idea reigns especially with those who attribute all of salvation to faith alone. It's an idea that's been around a long, long time. It's a nice image, instantaneous salvation. But let it be known, the new church teaches, that the case with the forgiveness of sins is quite different. Our sins are forgiven, but only if we do our part to start and continue the process. We're always involved, you know. And there's that word again. It pops up every time we talk about regeneration, creation, the Lord's glorification, the operation of the Holy Spirit, or any of the teachings of the new church. What's that word? You already know it. Process. Everything is process. If we can't think of things like this in terms of process, we really can't think of them at all in a rational way. I believe if you wanted to find a one-word definition for the new and the new church, what is genuinely new about it, it would be process. Our sins are forgiven, for sure, but not until a person, what did it say, sincerely repents, refrains from evils, and after that leads a life of faith and charity, doing so to the end of their life. That's quite a requirement. That's process. There is nothing instantaneous about it. But there's more. Like everything else in life, you only get out of the process what you are willing to invest in it. How did our other lessons say it? To the extent that their life is in keeping with the commandments of faith, their sins are removed. And to the extent that their sins are removed, they have been forgiven. What does that mean? It means no free lunch. You want a little forgiveness? Well, repent just a little. It's your business. You want to be sort of free of the guilt and memory of things you might have done? Well, live by a few of the commandments part of the time. That'll get you that. Would you like to kind of move on a little bit into a life of good and truth? Well, then do a little spiritual growth. You get what you pay for, is what I think these teachings are trying to tell us. Do you want to have a full, rich life without the slightest guilt or remorse, an abundant life of heavenly happiness here on this earth? Well, you can. The Lord told us, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, they will be saved. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. That's from John's Gospel. Well, he meant that. So can you have that? Well, he just said you could. Now, how are sins forgiven? Let's get right down to it. Well, they are removed, and there's that word. They are removed. But note well, removed does not mean erased, deleted, canceled, or otherwise eliminated. There are some important doctrinal points to examine here if this little bit of divine truth is to be of real use to us. There are reasons for what we believe. First, our thoughts and our deeds, the things we do, both good and evil, remain with us after death as we enter the next life. Well, everything goes with us into the next life. There's no magic. No, and why should there be magic? These things, their actions, attitudes, preferences, biases, things we've done to ourselves and others, they're ours. Ours to deal with forevermore. What a depressing thought if there were no process to send them away. But of course, there is. There is a river flowing from the throne of God that will carry these things away if we will only let them go. So we hold on to those things pretty tightly. 
We carry them around with us in a great big bag on our back. And sometimes we get used to that. But if we can let them go, they'll go. They can be removed. But how far away? It's a good question. As we've already learned, they can remove, be removed as far away as we will allow the Lord to carry them. The writings for the new church tell us that when falsities are being removed from a regenerating person, they are cast away to the lowest part of the natural. Half-truths exist in the more outlying parts, and falsities are cast away to the outermost ones. It's a nice thought. Now, note the phrase cast away here. It explains the process. A change of heart away from evil and falsity will allow the Lord to come in, flow in, we've found, and carry those unwanted things away. A change of heart has to occur first. The Lord won't do that unless you ask Him to. He says, I stand at the door and knock. You going to answer that door or not? That's our part. Okay. If we do, He will flow in and carry those unwanted things away. Finally, We've been given the actual mechanism for the process. Right here, we read it. It was called sincere repentance, okay? In Secrets of Heaven, number 9,014. Okay, first things first, sincere repentance. Repentance is not regeneration. It's the doorway into it. Regeneration is the process. Repentance is the decision to start the process. Once a person realizes that there is good and there is evil. That sounds so simplistic. Well, of course there's good and evil. There are people who don't know that. They don't know. There's a kind of a gray area between. They're in deep trouble that way. But as soon as you realize there's good and evil, that's repentance. So far, not much has happened. That's a big deal, but you haven't done anything. Next, reformation comes next. That's the beginning of the process. That's the turning around. Teshuva in Hebrew. Good and away from the evil. Am I right? Yes. This can be very modest at first. Simply turning away from evil, evil thoughts and actions, just turning away from them will do. But as we get better at it, the Lord responds by flowing in and carrying those evils away. Yeah. Now think about that. Now I'm going re to repeat Ezekiel's, Ezekiel's description. Think of the Lord as this river, and He's coming into. He's coming in to wash those evils downstream. Then when the man went out to the east with the land in his, land in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits. He brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The water came up to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through. The water came up to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river I could not cross, for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. That river of divine truth that flows from divine good gets deeper and wider. Just like we read, the more we learn to let the Lord fight for us against the hells, the more we learn to welcome the abundant new life of heaven. The more we do that, the deeper and wider that river gets. This is regeneration spiritual perfection, the process that lasts forever. So repentance is an attitude. It's a, it is a fear of evil. and It's a healthy fear at that. The hells are powerful. They could destroy you in an instant. You are not to wander into them alone. Another great teaching of the new church is that although we must operate as if we were fighting the hells of evil, falsity, guilt, envy, deceit, self-love, all the rest, as if we were fighting those, it is the Lord who does the fighting. Here's what our lesson said. No mere human being is able to move evils away. For by himself, no one is able to move even the smallest amount of evil away, still less to move the hells, and least of all, to do so forever. But we also read, in accordance with the appearance that people think and do what is good and true from themselves, when yet it is not them, themselves, but from the Lord, it has been said in the Word that they are clean from sins and also righteous. It's an appearance. We need that. The Lord bears iniquities or sins when He fights on behalf of a person against the hells. For no one is able to fight by himself against them. 
Rather, the Lord alone does this, indeed constantly for every individual person, yet differently with each one according to their reception of divine good and divine truth. So he's right there fighting for you all the time. Without it, we read last week, you'd be dumped into the lowest hell. And the good part is, well, the part is, we don't know that that's happening. And in fact, worse yet, we feel like it's us. The Lord says, okay, feel like it's you. Because you need to feel that, but remember that it's not. You know, you have two halves of your brain. Use them both. Feel like you're doing it, because that makes you feel strong and good, but then remember that you're not. All right. We must fear evil. Definitely. For it can consume us. But understanding this principle, we can operate from confidence that the Lord fears nothing. And he is in charge. The writings for the new church tell us that his love was the love of saving the human race. And this love was the essence of his life. For this was the divine in Christ. That's what Christ was all about. His love was the love of saving the human race. And this love was the essence of his very life. For this was the divine in him. Okay. In Isaiah also, where the subject is the Lord's battles. This is described in these words, which I read and I love. Surely they are my people, and therefore he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he lifted them up and carried them all the days of eternity. Do you remember being carried ever? Can you remember that? Like when you were tiny? And somebody picked you up. I can. What a feeling. Whoa, not a care in the world. Just, usually it preceded by a, come on, son. And then you get picked up and you just get carried. It was wonderful. I know you can if you'll try. What a nice thought. And it says here the Lord will do that your whole life. There's good news in all of this. How does the process work? Well, does it seem too complicated this removal business, well, there's repentance, then there's reformation, then there's regeneration, and then acting like we do the work while knowing that it's the Lord all the while. Okay, that, is that complicated? Well, Isaiah simplifies this for us. He lifted them up, he tells us, and carried them all the days of eternity. That's what we need to take home. Think back to those days when somebody carried you. Wow, that was nice. That is removals. All the cares of the world removed because someone else was bearing them. And all you had to do was be carried along. That river flowing from the throne of God will do that for you today. He's your heavenly Father. He'll carry you. He will lift you up as His love flows through you. Remember, love doesn't stop with us. It flows through us. He will lift you up as His love through you and that love will carry away all those rejected things that used to be your own way out ahead of the new life that's flowing in. They will be removed, it says, to the lowest natural or as far away as they can go. What is the lowest natural? I don't know, but that sounds good. It's way out there and I'm not going to be there to see it. And when they are there, although they are there, they might as well be gone. You see, that's the secret in all of this. Do they really go away? Can they just be, boom, go away? No, but they're so far away. Who could know? They're removed. Our sins are not magically erased when they are forgiven. There is no magic. We don't need magic. The Lord, who is mercy itself, bears these sins when he fights for us against the hills. As long as his good and his truth keep flowing in, our sins are constantly being displaced, removed to the periphery, the horizon, out of sight, out of mind. They are carried there by the river of the water of life, proceeding from the throne of God. They are as good as gone. Invite the Lord in and clear out a space for him. He will fill that space. 
Big space, little space, you decide. Whatever space you make, he'll fill it. Try a great big space, he'll fill it. As he does this, your lifeless, self-loving self is forced out and carried beyond the horizon of your spiritual landscape. Here's the kick, though. Don't ever stop. This is a process, remember, that is driven forward only by your continuous appeal to the Lord to keep flowing in. So don't stop. But as long as you don't stop, they go farther and farther away. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. Repentance is hearing that knock above all the noise and confusion of the world. Reformation is making the small but ever so important to answer the door. Open it, even a little, and in will flow the river of reformation, your salvation. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the river goes, will live. Amen. You'll rise, please. We'll say together our statement of faith. Call it our Adoramus. Saying together, we worship the one God, the Lord, the Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose humanity is divine, who for our salvation did come into the world and take our nature upon him. He endured temptation even to the passion of the cross. He overcame the hells and so delivered humankind. He glorified his humanity, uniting it with the divinity of which it was begotten. Without this, no mortal could have been saved. And they are saved who believe in him 
and keep the commandments of His Word. This is His commandment, that we love one another as He has loved us. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so eager to do our own work, to fight our own battles with the hells, battles which in truth only you can win. Help us to see you in all things, we pray, as conqueror, savior, but also friend. Help us, O Lord, to learn the perfect balance of faith in action and the acknowledgement that it is you at work all good things. Amen. We rise, please, for the benediction. The Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Well, this ends our worship service, and I'm glad you could come. I'm glad that you could also come wherever you are. And I know that some of you are far away. Uh, I think next week we are going to be out from under some of these onerous uh, restrictions placed upon us by our government about masks and distance and things and like that. I'm told that on the 24th, which is tomorrow, those are all going to be lifted. So I guess at midnight, the viruses just all go away. I don't know. Interesting thought. So maybe next week. Who knows? Doesn't matter. We're here. That's what counts. And you're there, and that's what counts. I won't recant all of this, uh, recount all of this stuff that I just said because there's some mar marvelous things that the new church teaches. When I first discovered the new church, there were two or three things that really caught me. And there were two or three things that kind of made me wonder, and I had to kind of put on the side for a while, to be honest with you, new ideas. When you step out of an old comfortable uh, paradigm, sometimes it takes a while to get used to a new one. But one of them was this idea of process, but as it pertains to removals. My goodness, yes. I had known people all my life who carried those sins around with them in a bag on their back, and it just became a way of life. Guilt. Shame, you know, all that stuff. And sometimes people would preach it right from the pulpit, which was unfortunate. Luckily, as a child, I didn't believe it because children don't believe that stuff. But now that I've found that there is a church that teaches these things, I'm just happy as a clam. That's all there is to it. So, yes, it's a process. We must initiate the process. We must keep going. But we don't do the fighting. That's the good part. We say, here's a thing, Lord, I want to get rid of. I'm really tired of it, so I'm going to shine a light on it, and you are going to help me. And then it will seem like I'm fighting because you have to get rid of a thing, and it's hard. It's not you, it's the Lord. 
You can feel like it's you, but you can't take credit. That's the only thing that we have to remember. So, removals. They're as good as gone. Are they still, are, are, can you unrob a bank? No, but the bank that you robbed is so far out there, it's as good as gone. You don't even recall it. And then I guess, if you ever get to the point where you can't find anything else bad in you for the Lord to remove, I guess you're an angel, I don't know. It's a nice thought. So, see you next week.